So the goals of this webinar is basically to help people save on their outdoor water bills and outdoor water use. So on the Front Range, about an average of 55% of our water use is outdoor, and most of that is on our turf grass. So of course, that's quite a lot of water, and we're a company that is focused on water conservation, so hopefully we'll give you some tips on how to save. And it's also to help you get the most out of your sprinkler system. So making small adjustments either to your schedule or your actual sprinkler heads can help save you sometimes hundreds to thousands of gallons of water per irrigation season. And the idea is to get more bang for your buck on the water that you are putting down on your grass. So the first thing we're going to talk about is the system performance. And this is um, going to be three different topics. So you can go to the next one, Nika. So the first thing that affects your sprinkler system performance is the design. So basically how your system is set up within your yard. This is the most expensive and hardest to change. So um, typically as an organization, we don't make huge design recommendation changes um, just because we know not everyone has $10,000 to spend on redesigning their system if it isn't ideal. Uh, the second thing is maintenance. So just like anything else, like your car, other parts of your home, your sprinkler system is going to need routine maintenance, whether that's changing out heads or nozzles or sometimes even pipes or your controller. It does need occasional uh, work and upgrades. So this can be easy changes or they can be really difficult changes and they can be things that are free to do or cost a little bit of money. And then the last thing is scheduling. This is free and easy. This is how you set up your controller clock to water your system throughout, water your yard rather throughout the season. So um, go ahead. So we're gonna start out just by talking some basic components in terms of your sprinkler system in case you don't really have a good concept of how the whole system works. This is kind of an x-ray view of your yard and your sprinkler system. So you can see um, where the backflow preventer is. That's a device that connects the city or water providers like water supply to your yard. Um, during the winter, this is closed off. And during the spring, summer is when it's turned on so that you can get water to your sprinkler system. It's basically just a valve that can like open and close. So that backflow preventer supplies water to your valve box. And we'll go over these each in more detail in the following slides. But the valves go to each individual zone in your yard. The valves turn on and off. So as you notice, a zone is when a few heads in one area all come on at the same time and then all go off at the same time. Each valve controls one zone. And then within that zone, you have the individual heads that pop up and you can kind of see you know, there's pipes that go out. It's usually in a square, but not always. It kind of depends on the shape and size of your yard. But um, it's typically about four to eight heads per zone in most homes. Uh, the other part of this system is your controller clock. So as you can see, there's electrical wires going to your controller, which most of the time is in like a garage or a basement. Sometimes it's on the exterior wall of your home. And the electrical wires run to the valves and will turn them on and off. Next slide. I think you skipped the backflow preventer. There you go. Okay. So again, this was the kind of the first part of your system. This is a backflow preventer. Um, some of these look a little different depending on your home. Some homes don't even have them um, visible on kind of the surface. Sometimes they're actually like in a valve box, especially in newer developments, but most people have a backflow preventer that looks something like this. And as you can see, again, they're basically valves that show you or if they're closed or opened. In the example on the left, when they're kind of parallel to the pipes, the little blue part, that means the water's open and you can get water to your yard. So the purpose of a backflow preventer is you want water to only come one way into your yard. You want it to come from the city supply to your home. You don't want the water to then flow back into the city supply in case, in case there's contamination, anything like that. So anyone who has potable water in Colorado, this is a requirement actually. Um, so let's see. 
in general, in Colorado, you want to activate your sprinklers, meaning you want this to be turned on. The general rule of thumb is after Mother's Day, um, just because we can get snow here late in the spring and we don't want sprinklers running when it's freezing because that could freeze your pipes, cause a burst and end up being a lot of money. We don't want that. Uh, and then sometime in the fall, usually mid-October, as you blow out your sprinkler system. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later in the presentation. So, all right. The next part of the sprinkler system is that valve box. So most of you have probably seen these little kind of rectangular green boxes in your yard somewhere. And this is where the valves live. These are kind of um, the heart of your sprinkler system. As again, they turn the zones on and off. They have a valve that opens it to allow water to flow through and closes it to stop the water from flowing to that zone. Usually when you have a potable water system, these are green. If you have non-potable water, it's usually like a lavender color. You might have one of these boxes in your home or you might have several depending on how many zones you have or just how large of a yard you have. Um, and there's typically maybe like three to six valves or yeah, per valve box. So this is kind of an inside view of what the valve box looks like. You can see that the electrical wires run to the valves themselves and the clock, the controller clock will send that signal and that signal opens or closes the valve. So that's how the controller helps control the water flow in your yard. Uh, these can get stuck occasionally if there's problems with the electrical wiring or potentially if there's rocks or dirt, other kinds of debris that get stuck in those valves. So they can get stuck open. And that's when you have a zone that turns on and just keeps running and running, even after it's supposed to turn off. Or conversely, it can be stuck closed where it's supposed to turn on and it doesn't, again, just because it's maybe stuck with a lot of dirt or mud or other kinds of debris. Um, all right, moving on to the next one. And this, your controller clock, as we talked about, is the one that sends the electrical signals to the valves. This is kind of the brain of your system. This is where you input your schedule and tell it what days you want to water, what time it should start, how long it should water each zone. And control clocks, there's dozens and dozens and dozens of different types, but they all essentially do the same thing, which is telling your sprinklers when they should be watering. Um, there's old ones that are called electromechanical and they might have gears and pins and kind of um, look a little intimidating, but those work just as well as these new electric clocks or um, some of the newest ones are smart controllers that you can control through an app on your phone. But even those, there's still gonna be a physical box that goes on your wall that has the wires that go to your valves. All right. So this slide is similar to the one we had before, just not so much an x-ray view, but just to show you that, you know, when the valve is open, that's going to water in this picture zone one. So in this photo, it's about three or four heads. It's all watering one segment of grass. And some people have it where it's nice and neat and their zones are all kind of in the same area. Some older homes like mine, you have zones that are split where Part of zone two is in the backyard and part of it's in the front yard. Um, it's just kind of all how your system was originally designed. But the idea is that only one zone at a time should be running. And that's just because um, otherwise your water pressure would be too low if you have multiple zones running at the same time. So that's why your yard is segmented into different zones to water separately. All right. So the next component is the actual sprinkler heads. So again, there's usually about four to eight per zone. Um, they are normally in the ground and of course pop up when it's time to water. The water pressure forces them to go up and start spraying. There's a little spring inside and that water pressure forcing up just pops it up. And then the actual nozzle is where the water comes out. And I actually have a little one in person, hopefully I can get this to work. Just to show you. So this is what's underground. This part here should be flush with the ground 
And then this part up top is the actual nozzle where the water comes out. On a spray head or a pop-up like this one, it literally can just unscrew. So that little nozzle piece can come right off and then screw right back on. Um, so the reason it's important to differentiate between these two things is sometimes it's just the nozzle that's not working over time. You might just need to replace this, which is very easy to do versus the whole head, which is a lot harder to do because it involves a lot of digging. So just wanted to give you that little vision. And let's see. All right, next slide, Nika. So there's two basic types of sprinkler head. One is a rotor and one is a spray head. A rotor is called a rotor because it rotates. Pretty obvious. <laughs> a spray head is stationary. They're also called pop-ups sometimes. Um, they are much smaller. So this is a rotor, this is a spray head. You can see, especially with the stem, this is very skinny and this is gonna be pretty thick. Um, rotors are generally a little bigger just because they need more pressure and they output water a little bit further. So they're just a little bit bigger to accommodate that. Um, so yeah, um, pop-ups or spray heads are usually for smaller areas, like a side strip. That is something that is a strip of grass between the road and a sidewalk. So that little like three or four foot patch of grass uh, that's usually where you see spray heads or like a front yard, whereas rotor heads might be more in a backyard or for big fields like a football field or a park. All right. And then within rotor heads, there are two distinct types. There is a gear driven and an impact rotor. The gear driven is a little bit newer of a model. It's more of a smooth back and forth, whereas the impact rotor is kind of the more traditional one that makes the classic sprinkler sound of um, so there's pros and cons to each. The impact rotor is a lot bigger, so it can shoot water a lot further, up to 150 feet away. So if you have a really, really big area, the impact rotor might be a better option. They're pretty low maintenance. Um, they are actually good for areas that have hard water. So if you have well water, or if you're maybe more up in the mountains, or in general, we just have hard water everywhere here, but especially those areas where it's maybe like non-potable or well water, the impact rotors can do a little bit better. And you don't need any tools to adjust them. You just need your fingers. So they're easy in that sense. Some cons are some people might not like the noise, especially if they're running at night when you're trying to sleep, they might be a little noisy for you. Uh, they are what I call a little more aggressive and just that they really fling water pretty far so you can get some overspray with it onto your fence or on the street. Um, they may not work very well if you have lower water pressure, just because it's a larger volume of water that needs to come out of them and they are bigger. And they can be a little bit more expensive to replace, not much, but maybe a five to $10 difference between the impact and the gear driven rotors. So the gear driven, again, it's a little bit smoother. So it does a little bit more of a uniform spray pattern. So if you have issues where your grass is kind of patchy in some areas, a little brown or a little green, usually gear driven helps do a more uniform spray. It does a little bit better if your water pressure is a little on the low side and uh, quieter, of course. And another benefit is you can adjust them when the water isn't running. It's hard to do that with an impact rotor. Usually it has to be on in order to adjust it. So those are basic pros and cons to those. And the nozzle of a rotor helps dictate a few different things. One is the radius, meaning how far out the water shoots. Another is the arc, which is the kind of side to side movement. So it can be like a 90 degree or a 180. So a full half, half circle or 360, which would be a full circle. Um, and excuse me, I, I kind of misspoke. That's not really the nozzle, um, but the nozzle is more of the the distance, sometimes it's the angle, the trajectory. So there can be a flat angle where it sprays out more flat or one that's a higher angle that's more of a rainbow arch. Um, and then you adjust the rotor to do the side to side. Sorry for misspeaking on that. Um, the different colors usually indicate just like a different type of nozzle, whether it's a low angle or a higher angle. 
um, there was, let me see here. So on one brand, it was colors differentiated if it was a shorter radius. There were ones that were higher flow, ones that are something called a match precipitation rate. Um, so it's basically just to the color is to differentiate what type of nozzle it is. And then I know it's probably a little hard to see, but on the red one, it says 2.0. That's the gallons per minute that it's putting out. Um, and then on the blue one right next to it, you can see there's an L on one side and an A on the other side. That stands for low angle. So the angle is important because it depends on the shape of your yard as far as what you might need. A lower angle would be good if you have like a small front yard where you have rotors and you want it to be more flat. Whereas if you have a really large area, you want more of that arch. Um, the flat is also good if you live in a really windy area because you don't lose as much to the wind. Um, let me see what else. And low angle is better for sloped areas as well. So if you have a slope, you want to have more, of course, that arch so that it's not just skimming on the top of the grass. And the nozzles for the impact rotor look pretty similar. Again, they're kind of color coded and that just indicates different types of nozzles that you can get. All right, and bouncing back to spray heads, there's basically two different types of nozzles that you can use. The first is a standard nozzle, which doesn't move. It just pops up and sprays. It doesn't move side to side. And then the newer version is a rotary nozzle, which spins um, kind of slowly, slow, little, usually a little slower than a rotor head does. And it has what I call the octopus arms, where it's a small stream that just kind of spins slowly and slowly and slowly. So the benefit of the rotary nozzle is that it tends to deposit water more efficiently in that it's a lot more even and it is much slower. So a lot of people will get confused about that. Like if it's efficient, why is it slower? But we have very dense clay soil out here in Colorado and it absorbs water very, very slowly. So you want sprinklers that put down water in a slower fashion so that it has time to absorb into the ground rather than running off or evaporating or pooling and attracting mosquitoes, that sort of thing. There are pros and cons though, like anything. So with the rotary nozzle, something that we've noticed in the field is they often get clogged and when they get clogged, they don't spin. And in that case, the watering is not very even because you have just those little jets and it's not moving. So only part of the grass is really getting wet. They can also break and actually spin way too fast, kind of out of control. And then it doesn't give you that same nice effect of having a more even slow watering rate. Um, but they are good to use in windy areas because the droplets of water are much fatter. And so they don't blow away as easily. And they're pretty good to use if you have a sloped yard. Because again, they just, they don't blow away as easily and they just cover more evenly. All right. So as I kind of showed you before, there's the actual head, which is the, the whole piece. This part right here is called the stem that pops up and the very top part is the nozzle. On here, you can see a few, oh, sorry, Nika, go back. There's a few different types of nozzles. There are ones that are adjustable. So the one in the bottom left-hand corner with the brown on it and the ridged lines is called an adjustable arc nozzle. So those are ones that you can do. The arc is kind of the spray pattern, how wide. So you can have it just be like a little 10 degree if you have just a little teeny corner piece of grass. It can be a 90 degree, it can be 120. So those are good for really oddly shaped areas or ones where you just want it to be really precise. The ones, the nozzles above the brown one are one called the U-series, and they have two openings of where the water comes out. So the top one, the water sprays a little higher, the bottom one sprays lower. And this helps just cover more evenly. So that's good for like a slope, or if you notice that you're getting kind of brown patches around the head, it might be nice to have this dual orifice nozzle. Um, and as you can see with the high efficiency rotary nozzle, they're a little bit 
longer and usually the filter is attached to them whereas the filter on the light brown one is a separate piece um, it's not really good or bad it's just when it's attached you don't lose it as easily sometimes you do lose the filter um if you take the nozzle off and the filter comes with it and that sort of thing all right so just as a review two basic types of sprinkler heads. We have your rotor heads and your spray heads. The rotors are for bigger areas. They do have a lower precipitation rate. I didn't really cover that too much, but that is how many inches per hour that the sprinklers put out. So they usually have a precipitation rate between about half an inch to an inch per hour. And it's lower because they move side to side. So that while they're putting out more gallons per minute, their one patch of grass is only getting hit every so often. So they have a lower precipitation rate. Whereas spray heads, they have a much higher precipitation rate when it's the regular type of nozzle. With a regular nozzle, it's about one to one and a half inches per hour. With the high efficiency rotary nozzle, it's pretty low actually. It's only about a quarter to a half an inch per hour. So if you're ever changing your spray heads to the high efficiency, you do have to adjust how long you're watering. Usually you have to triple how long you were watering before. So do keep that in mind if you're ever deciding to make this switch. They are much smaller, both spray heads and high efficiency usually cover a smaller area, like more of the front yard size. Um, in general, what you're going for is having one head type per zone. Because as I mentioned, they put out different rates of water. All right. Now we're gonna talk a little bit about drip. So drip kind of is still connected to your controller and your valves. People sometimes think they're separate things, but it's still part of your sprinkler system. It's still a valve opening and watering via a different method. But um, this the reason you would wanna do drip is because drip uses much less water than a traditional sprinkler. So if you have flowers or shrubs or veggies or anything that needs less water than grass and you don't have a drip system, consider converting or adding a drip system. It uses 30 to 50% less water. It deposits water at the root zone, which is where it's needed. So you have a lot less water waste um, and a lot less evaporation. It goes right where it needs to. It doesn't get the flowers or the top of the plant wet. So it reduces risk of mildew and other problems like that. And it usually results in fewer weeds because again, you're targeting the watering area versus watering the whole yard. All right. So I'll talk about just a few different types of drip. There are a lot of different kinds. So I just kind of highlighted the main ones that exist. Um, just to give you an idea if, you know, you don't have much concept of what your drip irrigation is like. So the first is a quarter inch soaker drip line. And this is basically just a tube that's a quarter inch wide that has holes about every six, nine or 12 inches. It is not pressure compensating. So that means that water just comes out at whatever rate that it's being pumped at. So it's not ideal if you're aiming for a very specific rate, but it's if that doesn't bother you so much, then this is a good solution. You would use it for small garden beds or veggie beds. Usually it's like a, comes in a 50 foot to a hundred foot length. So it is for smaller areas. All right. The next is very similar, a half an inch inline emitter tubing. So again, it's just bigger basically than the last one, but it is pressure compensated. So it's either a half gallon per hour or one gallon per hour rate. So if you want something that's specific, getting the half inch is a little bit better of an option usually has holes that are a little further apart. So about nine, 12, 18, or 24. This would be if you have long rows of plants, if you have really uneven ground or hills, anything that's basically not just perfectly flat. You do wanna use this in an area where all of your plants have about the same watering needs because it's the same rate throughout the whole tubing. And this would be for areas where you have dense planting. All right, the next is a button emitter. And this is basically when you have that half inch poly tubing, but you add these little extender pieces. So it can go right on the tube, like the picture in the center, 
or you can have the button emitter with what we call a spaghetti tube going out to a plant, or you can have the spaghetti tube from the main emitter out and then put the button emitter on the end. So there's different options depending on what you prefer. And you wanna use this when your plants are spaced a little further apart and you wanna have the tube going to each individual plant. So these are pressure compensated. They're most commonly about a half to two gallons per hour, um, but they can get up to 14 gallons per hour. So there is a pretty wide range of you know, water deposition rates. So again, they're better for plants that are a little bit further apart. As far as um, where to put the button emitters, in general, it is better to put them on the end of the spaghetti line, just because if they pop off, it's a lot easier to see that. Um, if the line gets cut, it's just, it, it's much easier to see where there is a leak and, but neither way is necessarily incorrect. But in general, the green picture is how you want to set up. All right. The last type of drip that I wanted to talk about is micro sprays. So these basically look like a small sprinkler. They usually cover a radius of about four to five feet. So this covers a larger area, obviously, than a standard drip. So you connect the quarter inch tubing basically to a stake in the ground and then to the main line for drip irrigation. It does have a higher flow rate up to 30 gallons per hour. So this is good for shrubs or trees that need a lot more water than just a standard drip or really dense flower beds. There are some pros and cons though, like anything. So again, this isn't the same as other drip where it deposits at the root zone. It's like a sprinkler, so it kind of sprays on top. So if there's flowers that don't like to get wet or you know they might get mildewy or other issues, you might not want to use a micro spray. Um, another drawback is since they're above ground, they can get knocked over or tilted the wrong way. So you do have to kind of make sure that they're always pointing in the right direction and you know just keep an eye on them to make sure that they're still functional. All right, so if you have a zone that is flowers or shrubs and it's watered by traditional sprinklers, if you wanna convert it, what you basically have to do is if there's say, let's five heads in the zone, then you're gonna wanna cap four of them. And a cap is that little white picture. It's just a little PVC cap, literally that you would screw on to the connector instead of a sprinkler head. And then you leave one head with this conversion kit that you see in the bottom right hand corner. So instead of having like this traditional sprinkler head, you get something that looks very similar, but you can attach those spaghetti lines to it and then convert everything to a drip. And you wanna do this, it's a lot more efficient. It's gonna save you a lot more water. We give out these conversion kits with our garden in a box program. Um, oh yeah. <laughs> And the last thing is just to talk about, you know, I, I touched on this with different types of plants have different watering needs. So flowers have a lot of different watering needs than veggies, than shrubs, than turf grass, than trees. So typically you want each sprinkler zone to water only one type of plant because of those different watering needs. So turf should be on all of its own zone. Veggies should be their own zone. Flowers should be their own zone. And this is in a perfect world, you know, not all sprinkler systems are set up this way. So if you have a zone that is part turf and part plants, you could use that conversion kit just on the areas where there are flowers and leave the regular sprinklers to water the turf. But in, again, in a perfect world, they would be on separate zones. All right, so we'll do a question break. All right, we had a couple of really good questions here. So let me pose this to you, Lisa. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay, great. All right, so talk, going back to talk about valves, mm -hmm. can one valve ever control more than one zone? I've heard of ones where there's almost like another valve upstream. <laughs> that controls four little valves, but in general, no, it's one valve per zone, as far as I understand. Do you, have you heard anything? I concur. In fact, really, it's the valve that makes the zone. So right. to make a sprinkler zone, you have 
any number of sprinkler heads. It can be any, I've seen, I've actually seen a zone just be one head, but typically you have at least four heads per zone. And then at HOAs, there might be hundreds of heads on one zone, but typically at a house, you have like, I'd say four to 10 heads on a zone. And what makes them a zone is they are connected underground by the PVC piping that Lisa showed on one of her earlier slides. And then that piping goes back to a valve. So if you put more piping or more heads on that connected to that same valve, you're not cr controlling another zone. The valve makes the zone. So one valve, when that valve opens, whatever heads pop up, whatever is connected underground to that valve, that is a zone. So yeah. one valve equals one zone. Right. And then we did have another question. Is there such a thing as a tall sprinkler? Every <laughs> year we get round green grass with brown grass around it. I think because our sprinklers are too short. Any <laughs> advice? They do come in different sizes. I think the standard is like a four inch or a six inch, but they do, especially for slopes, have ones that I think are 12 or 18 inch ones that pop up really, really high. <laughs> so you can get different sizes. Yes. Yes. And on that note, uh, Lisa did talk about the nozzles that have kind of the dual spray that spray further away and closer. But another thing that I want to bring up is something to keep in mind is that your sprinklers in any given zone work on a you scratch my back, I'll scratch your back kind of relationship. So if the area that's brown is immediately around a certain head, the issue is likely not with that head, it's with its neighbors. Mm -hmm. So its neighbors are not spraying far enough because you should have what's known as head-to-head -head coverage, meaning the water from one head sprays at least as far as its neighbors in every direction. So what I would encourage you to do is watch your sprinkler zone run and see, is there water falling in that area? And look at that and see if it's supposed, which head is supposed to be hitting that and then kind of go from there and assess why water is not going there. Yep. All right, so here's another one that just came in. If you do have a zone that's part garden and part turf, can you leave the grass sprinklers and just convert part for drip? Yep, like I said, that's kind of um, the alternate solution if, if it all is one zone. Sometimes you can split it if you have space on your clock basically for another zone, but again, that's a little pricier and a little more expensive work, but yeah, you can convert just one head to a drip, but you'd have to keep in mind that you're running the whole zone still for the same amount of time. So say you're watering it for half an hour, um, then you just have to keep in mind that that's both for the drip and for the turf. So you have to find the kind of right rate of gallons per hour to do the drip. And it takes a little work, but I know, again, some systems are just set up like that. So it is possible. Great. All right, thank you, Lisa. Mm -hmm. All right, and we do have a question here on how you adjust heads. I believe our next section is going to talk about adjusting heads. Yep. The next Correct. section is all about, about adjusting heads okay. and fixing minor issues. So we can talk about it then. Yeah. All right, fantastic. And the pressure isn't too great for the drip portion. I think that's I think that's the same person who asked about just converting part of the zone. Mm -hmm. So I would I'll chime in on that one. Um it depends on what the pressure is. So most drip lines like to be at around 30 PSI, which might be what the pressure is on your sprinkler zone already. It could be lower than that, or it could be significantly higher. So I would definitely look into that um, before I would consider doing that. Another alternative, again, just so you don't have uneven watering, would be to cap the heads that were watering the plants and just still treat that zone as a turf zone and water the turf and then hand water the plants. I know that's more time, but from a water conservation standpoint, that's actually more efficient. So it's really just up to you if you're trying to just save time and water more quickly, or if you're trying to save as much water as possible. Because if that's the case, I would just cap the area that's watering the plants and hand water those. Yeah. And it dep depends on how established the plants are too. If they're 
more than three years old, sometimes they don't need additional irrigation. They can just live off of rainwater, but it depends on the type of plants you have and how many and again, how old they are. All right, well, I think we are ready to move on to the next section. Mm -hmm. So this next section is we're going to be talking about how to make adjustments, uh, common issues to look for, is basically all the general maintenance that you're going to want to do for your sprinkler system. All right. As we talked about, um, usually you turn your sprinkler system on in the spring, sometime typically in May, and you turn it off in October. So the first thing that you should do when you turn it on in the spring is do a visual inspection. You don't know if what happened over the winter, um, if anything got damaged, if you know heads even just got turned a little bit. So look at each of your zones running for about two minutes each and just see if anything looks broken, anything looks funky. And again, we'll go over what kind of things to look for. Another thing is to mow regularly uh, throughout the summer. You don't want your grass to be too long. And this seems like kind of a duh thing, but if your grass is too long, it's gonna block your sprinklers and the water won't get to where it needs to go. Um, you also don't want to mow too short though, because then a lot of the soil is exposed and it gets very, very dry. So ideally you want your grass to be about three inches long. Um, whenever you're mowing it, you never want to mow more than a third of the length of the blade of the grass, because it can stress it out too much to lose too much of the height. So in summer, typically you want to mow about every four to seven days depending on how fast your grass is growing. Just keep an eye on it and basically try and aim for that three inch mark. Do a visual inspection about once a month. So most sprinklers go off in the middle of the night. So a lot of people don't know what they're doing because it's three in the morning. And of course you're sleeping at that time. So about once a month, run them again for two minutes each and just make sure again that nothing's broken. You don't have any little geysers anywhere. You don't have heads that are spraying directly on your fence, anything like that. Um, Adjust your watering schedule throughout the season. So a lot of people like to have this idea of I'm going to set it and forget it. And with sprinklers, you just can't do that. Um, oops, excuse me. So when you first activate in May, usually you're only watering one to two days a week. As it gets into the summer and it's very hot, you're going to want to water about three days a week. And then as we head into fall, like right now, in the next few weeks, if you're doing three days, you can cut down to two. And if you're still watering in October, you can cut down to one day a week. So you do adjust your days. You can adjust your run times too if desired, but typically our philosophy is just to adjust the days. And then again, you want to winterize usually sometime in about mid-October. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. All right. So the main things that are common issues and things that we look at when we do our evaluations are overspray, clogged nozzles, blocked heads, tilted heads, low heads, and then of course, anything that's broken. So the first one, and this is by far the most common, is overspray. It's probably a self-explanatory term, but it's when water is spraying on anything that doesn't need water, like a sidewalk or a driveway or a fence. So a little bit of overspray is inevitable just because in order to get the edge of the grass, sometimes you have to go over a little bit. And just because it's the nature of sprinklers, they're not gonna do a perfect square. <laughs> So a little bit is unavoidable, but when it's like this first picture, when it's going five feet out into the street, then you're gonna wanna adjust it. Um, typically you do that by adjusting the radius, which is how far out things go or the arc. And I believe we'll go over that in slides a little, in a little bit. Yes, there we go. <laughs> so for rotors, you can see there's two sections where you can adjust the radius and the arc, which is the path of travel. So that red circle is the radius. Again, so how far out the sprinklers shoot. So there is this little tool, which we call a hunter key. And this little metal end goes into the part that's an arrow that's kind of in the front of the head. And you just do a righty tidy lefty loosey movement. So if you turn to the right, it shortens the radius. If you turn to the left, it lengthens it. And there's usually a pretty big range for rotors. Um, it's like 18 to 25 feet that you can adjust it. One thing to know as you adjust the radius down is 
the stream of water is pretty narrow when it's long, and as you shorten it, it starts to fan out a bit. So that can be a disadvantage. Again, you need a little overspray if it fans out, because as it goes to like the edge of your grass, it's gonna spray a little bit like on the sidewalk or your driveway or whatever the case may be. So do be careful of that. Also be careful as you are lengthening the radius that you don't accidentally pop the nozzle out. <laughs> so what happens is there is a little screw that goes down. I don't know if I can, let me see. I'll try and show you on this. I don't know if I'll be able to hold it up. Okay, if you can see it very well. I'm not sure how visible it is, but there's a little teeny screw right there. And that screw is what determines the length of the water spray. Thank you, Nika. <laughs> um, so as you're pushing it down, that's kind of why it fans out, is it's literally disrupting the path of the water and it's making it fan. So then as you loosen it and lengthen it, it's going to go back up, but you can accidentally unscrew it to the point where the nozzle is going to shoot right off because <laughs> the screw is what holds it in place. So do be careful as you're adjusting the radius to not back it out too much. <laughs> All right. Thanks for going back there, Nika. All right. And then as you can see, the yellow circle is what we call the arc, which is the side to side path of the water. And you can see a little bit better on the rainbird head on the left that there is a plus and a minus sign. So the minus sign is obviously to kind of make it shorter and plus makes it wider. There is something on a rotor called a hard stop. So basically one side is set. You can't really adjust it. Sometimes that's on the left, sometimes it's on the right. It depends on the brand. So if say your hard stop is on this side, then you can only adjust going this way. And you are not going to really know unless you know what brand it is and you research it online or you just start adjusting and see which way it goes. But on this tool, you use this plastic side, which you probably can't see too well, but it looks like a little bow tie or maybe a hard piece of hard candy or something. It goes in that. And again, you just do kind of righty tighty, lefty loosey, and it will adjust it left to right. Um, with rotors, you do kind of have to flow with the water as it's moving back and forth as you're adjusting. So it might get a little bit wet. Uh, you can do these when the water is turned off. It's just harder because you'd have to hold it up with your hand and you can't really visualize it as well, but it is possible. So that's the basics on adjusting those. The other thing, last thing I'll mention is you can see on the rainbird head on the right, there's another little hole that's kind of the shape of this plastic end. That is to pull the head up when the water's not running. So you put this in that little shape, twist it 90 degrees, and then you can use these finger holes to basically pull the head up. So that's what that hole is for in case you were curious about that. <laughs> All right. And then on an impact rotor, one nice thing about these is you do not need a tool to adjust them. So you can just use your fingers. So to adjust the radius, there is just a little, you can see under the red circle, again, a piece that you just righty tighty, lefty loosey to shorten and lengthen. Um, and one nice thing about impact too, is you can stop them as they're watering. So you don't have to follow it as it moves back and forth. You can literally just hold it in place. So that does make it a little bit easier. And then as far as adjusting the arc or the path of travel, what it does is it has a little metal pin that hangs down. And as you can see, there's kind of some pins that hang to the side. And what it does is it bounces back and forth between those pins and that's how it determines its path. So you adjust those pins that are on the side back or forth and you can make it pretty much any arc that you want. If you want it to be a 360 degree rotation, that little pin that flips down, you can just flip it up and it will spin 360. All right. So as far as spray heads, um, these are pretty easy to adjust. The Sorry here. There is a screw on top and that does the radius. So again, righty tidy, lefty loosey. I know I'm being a broken record with that, but you turn to the right to shorten it, turn to the left to lengthen it. Most have about a two foot 
radius adjustment that you can do. And nozzles that are different colors are different like radius lengths. So there's some that are like a four to six foot, six to eight foot, eight to 10 foot. And you just have to know which color corresponds to the brand that you want. As far as the arc, some nozzles are fixed so you cannot change the arc. So they might be like a 90 degree or 180, so a half circle. Others are like this one in the middle or like that we showed you earlier where you can adjust it. So you, where that person's fingers are, again, righty tighty, lefty loosey. Excuse me one second. <coughs> Talking too much, all right. So you would, on the ones that you can, you adjust the arc that way. Okay, Nika? All right, so clogged nozzles. These are pretty obvious when you see them. You know, water's gonna be coming out of only part of it and there might be some dirt or rocks or something in there. So in order to unclog it, usually what we do is we clamp it like this, just so that the head stays up. You unscrew the top part and you get, there's a little filter in here. This one's kind of stuck, but in general, you pull the filter out as well, put it in a cup of water, rinse it for like five minutes, put it back on. You can also use like a toothbrush or um, a paper clip, something that just gets the gravel or whatever is stuck in there out and it unclogs it for you. All right. <clears throat> All right, blocked heads. So this is basically when there's an object in front of the sprinkler that prevents it from spraying where it needs to go. Whether that is a giant bush, a giant boulder, sometimes it's like the landscape edging that goes around um, when you have a different part of like rocks or mulch and then the grass, sometimes the head's behind that landscape edging and it hits that instead of going out onto the grass. So when possible, remove the obstruction. If you can't remove the obstruction, you might be able to move the head a few inches by digging it up and putting it somewhere else. In the case of the bushes, you probably just want to convert that one to drip. <clears throat> All right, so tilted and low heads are a pretty common problem, and this is just because ground settles over time, you know, and it's not even. So as heads sink in, they kind of tilt over or they get too low. You can see sometimes the grass lays really flat around a head when it's too low. Um, the way that you deal with this is basically you do have to dig it up and reposition it, um, pack some dirt around it to lift it up. So I will say low heads are a little bit easier to deal with. You can get something called a riser. This one's very small, but basically it's literally just a little extender piece. Um, as you dig around the head and pull it out, put this little extender piece on and then put the head on the extender piece. So lifts it up a few inches. A tilted head is just a little bit harder. You have to dig a lot more around it, position it up. Some people will kind of put a big rock or something heavy there to keep it straight up and down. Um, so it it's really, the severity of it is what would dictate to me whether I need to dig it up and do something or not. Like if your head is low enough that it's only popping up this much from the ground, you need to probably dig it up, put a riser on there. If it's tilting so much that it's practically 45 degree angle, probably need to dig it up and reposition. Um, Cause the problem with these is basically the water isn't gonna get where it needs to go. If it's tilted, it's gonna shoot down on one side and way too high on the other. If it's low, it's not gonna clear the top of the grass and you're gonna get a lot of patchiness. And again, the water just won't reach out as far. And then of course, broken heads are a big problem. So sometimes it's obvious, like the second picture where it's a, a big geyser. I believe in that picture, probably the head has literally the whole thing has popped off. So you're getting this huge several foot tall geyser. But sometimes it's more subtle, like you just notice there's a lot of water pooling around, or maybe it's just leaking out of the base a little bit. Um, so you just have to kind of look around your system, see if you can see water bubbling up or pooling. If you step on it and it feels almost like a waterbed, that can indicate that the, either your head or your pipe is broken. Um, and also low pressure. So like if your heads aren't popping up all the way, probably there's a leak somewhere, like a broken pipe or a broken head somewhere. So 
So just some basics on how to replace a head if you ever need to is you dig the immediate area around the head. I use a small shovel like that just to make sure that you don't hit the pipe and break it. <laughs> you do want to be very careful as you're digging around and also you don't want to disturb your grass more than you have to. So dig a few inches around the head, unscrew it. You screw the new one on or if you need to put a riser, put a riser on and then the head. Turn the water on for a minute just to flush the new head. Put the nozzle on and pack dirt around it and put the grass back in and you're done. I know that sounds very, very simple, but as someone who's had to do this this summer and dig through our clay soil, it can be kind of a wrist workout. <laughs> um, and some other things to know that might not be obvious are you do need to know what size fitting it is. So that's basically the size of this little hole. So it's usually either a half inch or three quarter inch. And that's just gonna depend on the brand and type of head that you have. Um, usually for bigger heads like a rotor, it might be more like a three quarter inch. For smaller heads like a spray head, it's gonna be a half an inch. You also have to know if this is male or female. So female is um, goes in, male as it goes out. You can get little adapter pieces that sort of look like this one if needed. Basically you just kind of Screw it on and then screw that on to the where like the, the fitting to the pipe goes. Um, what I would recommend is looking up if you can see what brand of sprinkler head that you have, your old one, look it up online to see um, where they sell that same model. If you don't know, just be prepared that you might have to get some kind of adapter to make that work. And then just so you know, you got this big old impact rotor here and a regular rotor and people wonder like, can I convert one to the other? And yes, because the inlet size is still the same. You might need some more dirt to pack around if you're converting from an impact to a regular rotor, just because obviously this is much bigger in terms of space. So you'll need more dirt to pack around this guy. But in general, the connection to the actual pipe is the same. Okay. Okay, and then last thing as far as general operation and maintenance is, as we've talked about, you want to winterize your system. So if you're new to Colorado or just new to owning a home, um, this is something that you have to do to make sure that your pipes don't freeze throughout the winter and burst and cost you thousands of dollars to repair because no one wants that. So ideally you're doing this before the nighttime temperatures dip below freezing. And that can be a little hard to predict and it's different for different areas of the front range, but in general, that's sometime in mid-October. Um, again, for your specific area, just keep an eye out on the weather and research it and turn your system off when you want. Um, if you turn off your system a little earlier than you'd want to, you can always water your grass by hand with a hose if you need to. Um, but the idea with winterization is basically there is compressed air that goes through your system to get all the water that's left in the pipes and the heads out so that they don't freeze. Generally, you do want an irrigation professional to do this because most of us don't have an air compressor laying around at home. Um, also, you do have to make sure you're giving the right pressure so you're not causing wear and tear or any issues when you're using this equipment. So typically you hire a landscaper just for me personally, you know, I can't tell you prices across the front range, but ours was about $75 to blow out last year. Um, <clears throat> in these cases too, what they're going to do on your backflow preventer is close that off just so that water isn't going to come from the city into your yard. Okay, and we'll pause there again just for some maintenance questions. All right, Lisa, we have a few questions. So one that I thought was a great question, actually all these are really good, is can you use a Phillips head screwdriver if you don't have the adjustment tool? Um, I think you use a flat head actually. And yeah. so, I mean, I get this is a specific tool, a rain bird, but it, it's, it's just kind of a flat head. I don't know if you can really tell, um, but some of them, actually some rotors even just require a screwdriver. Yes. So. You don't have to use this, but I'll, I will say this is very cheap too. It's like $1.50. Um, and if you buy a new head, sometimes it comes with it. So and again, just... those tools are brand specific. So Lisa, can you hold those two up again? 
Yep. So the white one that looks really funky is a hunter key because it is for hunter brand. And the green screwdriver is a rainbird key or rainbird adjustment tool. So it is intended for rainbird rotors, although it is a little more generic because it's basically a flathead screwdriver. It does have a few little extra notches on the side. It's mm -hmm. not just a screwdriver, but it it functions largely like a screwdriver. Right. Uh, and so on spray heads, you could just use a, a small screwdriver. Correct. It's just a regular screw. But it's it's a pretty small flathead screwdriver it's, it's that you need to, do, yeah. to, to mm -hmm. do that. So great question there. And then when positioning, repositioning a tilted head, do you have to touch the line? Potentially, I, it depends on what, like how the fitting is set up. If that's really tilted, you might have to kind of, the tube that goes from where the head goes to the actual yeah. lateral line, you might need to adjust that. Yeah, actually, you shouldn't have to adjust the lateral line itself. Correct. I'm actually going to go find our slide previously. So here we go. Yeah, that's that'd be a good visual to have. So yeah, that black arm, let's say it's called like a funny tube or something. Yeah, funny pipe. Um, it's called a swing arm, but it's usually made out of what's called known as funny pipe. So it's flexible. Whereas that PVC, that white PVC at the bottom is your lateral line and that's rigid. Whereas that swing arm is flexible on purpose so that when mm -hmm. there is an impact, whether it's by you walking on it or a lawnmower to that head, that gives way a little bit to not rupture the pipe. So mm -hmm. whenever you are repositioning a head, whether it's because it's tilted or it's low, you are going to be manipulating that swing arm largely because you are, you're going to have to move that because that's probably part of what's kind of holding the head in position. But you should not have to interact with the lateral line itself. Right. Yeah. And then leave that up for just a second, Nika. I don't know if I really emphasize this, but that... This part, this base part of the head should be in line with the ground. So that's what Very you're important. Thinking. We we see that a lot where mm -hmm. heads are what what is referred to as proud, where part, you know, they're the even when the head is not in use, it's popped down, it's sticking up like an inch or two inches above the soil. You mm -hmm. really don't want that because it really makes it prone to damage. Yeah, your, by, mower, head or your, your kids or your dog or your mower yeah. <laughs> or your car. If it's something that's on the edge of a driveway, we see that all the time. Yeah, so, or even snow, like heavy snow can damage it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And let's see, this one is a little bit from the previous section. We didn't get to them. So uh, what is the biggest impact sprinkler as far as radius goes? I honestly, I don't know, but I know that they the, the impacts like that you see on golf courses and stuff sometimes can throw well over 100 feet. Yeah, it uh, said 150 is what I found online. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. They can flow, throw a little farther for sure. Yeah. And then in regards to mowing, we talked about mowing your grass. Ideal height is about three to three and a half inches. Someone is asking about clover. I mm -hmm. personally don't really have any knowledge about clover. Uh, do you happen yeah. to know, Lisa? I don't happen to. I know you don't mow it as much. You right. do still have to mow because it gets tall eventually, yeah. but I believe it's a slower growing and it stays obviously more close to the ground. Yeah. Um, so that's a good question. I, you know, when I don't know a good resource, I like to refer people to typically is like CSU extension. Mm -hmm. um, so they might have something on, they have a website called plant talk on there where they might have some specifics on clover, but I don't know that unfortunately. Okay. All right. There is a question in here that's very specific to someone's situation. So I'm not going to cover that one here. Um, okay. But the, here's another one. Should the backflow preventer be completely closed? The sprinkler guys that winterize our systems have always kept them three quarters open, including mm -hmm. the valves. Our home has a separate shutoff to the sprinkler in our basement. So I know you have a sprinkler system. My understanding, I don't have a sprinkler system and we don't, as Resource Central, we do not perform this service. Mm -hmm. But my understanding is that it is common to not close the backflow mm -hmm. preventer all of the way. Is that correct? Yeah, mine was like that. Um, so, and especially if you have a separate area of where the water turns on and off, like I do as well in our basement, we have like a water turn on and off. So I I don't know the rationale behind that necessarily, unless that's just to keep a little bit of airflow or something. Um, but if that's, again, I'm trusting your irrigation professionals to know what they're doing. <laughs> and ours was like that this past fall. Um, so, yeah. Great. And then how deep are the main lines buried? I think it's usually between um, 
six to 12 inches? I would agree with that. It really depends on who installed the system. Um, but I would agree with, with Lisa that it's generally about six to 12 inches. And mm -hmm. then on that note, someone asked if the, could the funny line to that swing arm easily be cut when digging? If you really went deep. And as I said, that's why you want to be careful when you're repositioning that you're not stabbing it. <laughs> um, so just dig, it, especially be careful as you get closer to the base of that head that you're not, you know, it's pretty hard to gouge through clay anyway, but just dig with caution. Good advice. <laughs> all right. That looks like all of those questions. So I am going to move us back. And Lisa, we've got about 10 minutes to I know, wrap up yeah. the presentation. So we need to pick it up a little bit. So I'm going to unfortunately have to speed through scheduling here. I apologize. But last component is doing a good watering schedule for your yard. I mentioned before how many days a week that we recommend is usually one to two days in the shoulder seasons. So kind of spring and fall, three days a week during the summer, but we'll go over all the different components. So you need days, run times for every zone, and start times in order to have a program run. Most clocks also have multiple programs, and this would be if you want to have your turf on a separate program from your drip. Like say you want to water your drip five days a week, but your grass three days a week, different programs allow you to do that. Um, there's something called a seasonal adjust feature, and this allows you to either increase or decrease your run times by a percentage. Um, so if you'd rather have all of your run times increase or decrease at different times of the year, you can use that seasonal adjust. We don't typically suggest that at Resource Central. Again, our philosophy is more to either add days or cut days rather than adjusting run times, but this is an option if you prefer that. And then a uh, sensor toggle switch. Most clocks have the ability to add like a rain sensor or soil moisture sensor. So there it will be an active or bypass toggle that you can see like on this clock, it's on the right hand side, right under where it says X core. Um, basically a rain sensor will turn off your system when we've had a big rainstorm. So definitely recommend those if you don't have one. All right, so as far as scheduling best practices, some water providers do have restrictions on which days to water. Sometimes these are based on address. Like if your address ends in an even number, then you're supposed to water Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And then if it's an odd, you're supposed to water Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, or something along those lines. So if you don't know, I would check your water provider's website and see if they have certain restrictions and what they are. Almost every water provider in this area has restrictions on time that you can't water between 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. And this is because it's very inefficient to water in the heat of the day. You should not be watering in the middle of the day. It's going to scorch your grass. You're going to lose most to evaporation. It's bad, so don't do that. <laughs> um, all right, the run times that you're going to set are for individual zones. So you can do different run times for all your zones. Some people do just kind of leave their run zones uniform across every type. That's not really necessarily a best practice because you might have different head types. There might be different sections of your yard that get full shade versus full sun. So you do want to customize it to the individual zone's needs. And then you do want to do something called cycle and soak. This is one of our primary recommendations. And cycle and soak, if you haven't heard of it, is instead of watering all in one run, you want to water for a little bit and then let it rest in between so that it actually can sink into the soil and get where it needs to go rather than running off or evaporating or anything like that. So instead of watering, say, a zone for 15 minutes, you might water it for five and then let it rest for about an hour, water for five, let it rest for an hour, water for five, let it rest for an hour. And the way you achieve this is typically just by starting three separate start times. So Nika, if you want to advance, I think the next slides will probably go over that more. Uh, maybe not yet, but I'll go back to it. <laughs> um, Okay, yeah, this isn't good. So this is just an example schedule. So if your first zone is for seven minutes, your second zone, you wanna run for 25 minutes and the third, you wanna run for 10 minutes. That's a cycle of what, 42 minutes. So you can set them like an hour apart, an hour and a half apart, two hours apart, whatever you prefer. There's not really a set time that you need to soak, but generally we say about one to two hours. So. What you would do is you would set the start times, the first start time as three, the second start time is 4.30, and the third start time is six. 
And what it's going to do is it waters in order. All clocks always do a numerical order. So it's going to start with zone one and then go to zone two and then go to zone three and then turn off. And then it's going to turn back on at 4.30 and do zone one for seven minutes, zone two for 25, zone three for 10, and then rest. So that's the, I know I went through that really fast and I apologize, we're just running short on time, but that's kind of the gist of how you do a cycle and soak schedule. So people always want to know, how long do I water for? And it really, really depends. Uh, depends on the head type, depends on your water pressure, depends on this how close your heads are to each other. But as a very, very general range, based on what the standard inches per hour precipitation rate is for different head types, you should do 20 to 30 minutes for spray heads, 30 to 60 for rotors, or 75 to 150 minutes for those high efficiency rotary nozzles. So again, those are a very long run time. And then drip, drip really, really varies depending on the species of plant type and like if it's flowers or bushes or trees, um, drip is a pretty tricky thing to be able to know the exact right amount for each plant on your drip line. Um, okay, let's move on. But this is a very, very general guide and I know it might be a little small, but uh, what you would do for drip again, kind of very blanket recommendations. So for your specific yard and plants, I would look at something like CSU extension to know exactly the watering needs. But I have on the left, you can see kind of different types of drip. And then up top is the frequency and how long to water for. And you can see for most of them, it is a pretty wide range, like 30 to 60 minutes or um, 40 to 80 minutes. So again, <laughs> I know that's a very general recommendation, but it's just difficult to give specifics on drip lines. Okay. All right. Yeah, I know that was super, super speedy. <laughs> um, well, Lisa, do we want to revisit this program again? Kind of talking about yeah. the, two, the two different programs here. Wait, let's do that. So as I mentioned, you can use different programs if you want to have your grass on one and your drip on the other. So for one reason, you might want to water your drip on different days or you know, fewer days per week, more days per week. And also you don't want to necessarily do the cycle and soak for your drip because it deposits water so slowly that you really don't need to do that. So this is a sample program of like program A. Say you want to water on Tuesdays and Fridays for your turf grass. Again, you're doing different run times for your zones. Maybe zone one is a spray zone, which is why it's fewer minutes. Maybe zone two is rotors, which is why it's longer. And zone three is sprays, but it's in an area that gets a lot of sun. So you want to do a few more minutes. And these are the run times per cycle, by the way. So it's actually multiplied by three for your total run time for that whole day. So zone one's actually going to get 21 minutes of water. Zone two is going to get 75 minutes and zone three is going to get 30 they're just broken up into different cycles. And then program B is gonna come on when all the turf zones are done because it starts at 7.30 and then it runs for an hour. Again, you don't need to cycle and soak that. You can run that even if it's trees and you're watering for them for a couple hours, you can do it all in one run. All right, and we're at 7.45 again. So I know that was like <laughs> the very abbreviated version of how to do scheduling. But um, just some key takeaways is your sprinkler system is only as strong as its weakest link. Design is a very tricky and expensive thing to fix at a time. So if you can't change the design, focus on what you can control, which is doing that basic maintenance and the scheduling. Make sure you're regularly inspecting your system. Don't just assume it's working as it should be. So I personally, I always do my last start time when the sun's up and I'm awake so that I can look at it and make sure that it's doing what it should be doing. So I do like 5 a.m., 6 a.m. and 7 a.m. for mine. You don't have to do that, just throwing that out there. <laughs> if you don't do it, you know, if it's normally in the middle of the night, then just pick one day a month on like a weekend or something when you have time and just run each zone for about two minutes to see how it's doing. Make sure that you're doing adjustments and repairs in a timely manner especially a broken head's going to waste hundreds of gallons of water while it's running if it's one of those little geysers. So repair it as soon as possible. <laughs> Most heads are like 10 to $15, so they're not super pricey. And the life of a head 
can range anywhere from two years to 15 years, depending on the brand and the quality. Um, whereas nozzles probably need to be changed out every few years. So do make sure that you're always looking at them and changing them out as needed. Try to have one hydrozone per sprinkler zone when you can. So basically one head type per zone and have it be the same type of plant also. So all grass in a zone, all flowers in a zone, all shrubs in a zone. Again, doesn't always happen, but in a perfect world. Make sure you're using the right head type in the right space and doing it for the right runtime. Implement cycle and soak. Even if your clock doesn't have the capability to do three cycles, most have the capability to do two at least, and two is better than one, especially um, for those longer run times like rotors have. Make sure you're adjusting your watering schedule throughout the season. And I didn't really mention this before, but just so you know, it's okay if your grass isn't bright green. You're not a golf course. It doesn't need to be bright green. And most people have Kentucky bluegrass, which is a cool season grass. So in the summer, it doesn't look quite so bright and green and pretty. It's a little bit more straw-like. And it will get pretty as we go into September, October. All right. That is everything. So Lisa, we do have a couple more questions. Yep. I'm actually going to flip back to a previous slide about the drip conversion. So this question, it was pretty specific, but I'm going to make it a little more general to apply to everybody. It's about mm -hmm. converting to drip. And if you're wanting to convert a zone or zones that have, say, upwards of nine heads, how right. to do that? This person is asking, do they need to run half inch poly tube from each head or mm -hmm. how they would do that? So let me actually pull up. Here it is. So I these, think, I mean, depending on how big your zone is, if it's nine heads, you might want to have two heads that you convert, like one on each end. But I think in general, you just want one. Yeah. yeah. You can actually run a couple hundred feet of that poly tube generally for a drip zone. Right. So unless, to Lisa's point, you have an enormous zone, I would cap all heads except one on each zone and then you run all your poly tube off of that yeah. because you can run that and then you can have a, any number of the spaghetti lines with the different emitters off of that now the area that this person is referring to it sounds like it's actually two zones and mm -hmm. so i would convert one head for each of those zones and then cap the rest of the heads and you can convert both a spray zone and a rotor zone. I've had people ask about that. Yes. And you can and just make sure you're getting the right cap size. Again, it's that inlet size, whether it's a half inch or three quarter inch. Um, and again, you might need an adapter piece potentially for that conversion head, but that's like an, a 50 cent yep. piece that you need to get. <laughs> and then the other thing we have here is more of a... Uh, a comment for us, and I appreciate this. We had a couple people chime in about the backflow preventers, mm -hmm. basically confirming that, yes, those are not supposed to be all the way closed. They should be partially open gotcha. because water can be trapped in there and then freeze in the winter and burst it. So that is why Very those good. are not basically <laughs> closed the entire way. Gotcha. And that, like we said, that's a little, we don't really touch the backflow preventers. So that's a little outside of our scope. <laughs> so I appreciate that. Yeah, it's good. Great. All right, folks. Well, that concludes our webinar. Uh, we don't have any more questions currently. Lisa and I are happy to hang out for a few more minutes. If you do have any other questions, three go, please go ahead and throw them up there and we're happy to address them. Otherwise, thank you so much for joining us. Some of you asked about getting a copy of this, so we do not send out copies, but we, we have recorded it and we will be posting it on our YouTube channel. And so you can certainly review it there. And we also did a very similar presentation that Nika presented back in March on the YouTube channel. So again, most of the information is the same, although we do have different styles and there was different questions on them. So that video will be posted there as well on our YouTube channel. Yeah. All right. And I believe this is our last webinar of the season. So if I you did two webinars true. for us, thank you so much for yeah. you know, supporting Resource Central and coming to us for your basic gardening needs. So yeah, everyone enjoy your Labor Day weekend. And mm -hmm. thank you. <laughs> Get these. We are getting some thank yous and some kudos for our presentation. So thank you all for participating as Lisa said. Mm -hmm.
All right. Well, I don't see any more questions coming in. Oh, excuse me. Here's one that just came in. Okay. Can I put a drip zone on one head in a zone and leave the rest to water turf? Yes, you can. We don't recommend it. So that makes what we call a mixed zone. So ideally for each zone, you have one head type. So you, it's all spray heads or it's all rotor heads or it's all drip. The reason for that is when you're watering your turf grass and your, say, your perennial shrubs on the same zone, since they're on the same zone, that means they're on the same watering schedule. And so if your watering schedule caters to your grass, which is typically going to be three days a week, three cycles for X amount of time, you're likely overwatering your plants because depending mm -hmm. on the type of plants, either way, it's going to have a different watering need than your grass does. They may, they may be established perennial shrubs that only need to be watered once a week. And so if they're on the same zone as your turf grass, you're going to be overwatering them. Conversely, if you cater to your drip and your plants, you're going to be underwatering your grass. So that's why we really recommend that you have only one hydra zone, which is a type plant of a certain watering eave on each sprinkler zone and just have one head type per sprinkler zone as well. So yes, you can do it. And we, in our work, we see it all the time uh, because it's easy. People say, oh, I'm just going to convert this sprinkler head in the corner to drip and water all of this too with my grass. So we do see it. It's not wrong per se, and it's certainly your sprinkler system and up to you, but it's not the most efficient thing to do. And again, you're probably either underwatering your grass or overwatering your plants. Mm -hmm. So if that's your only option. Yeah. Because there's sometimes a zone where like at my house, there's one sprinkler that was watering some shrubs. And I'd still say it's better to convert it because then you're not wasting the water from that sprinkler and overwatering your flowers. But again, there's just know the limitations that it's still kind of on the same schedule as your turf. <laughs> yep. So again, not ideal. Again, another option is hand water your plants because again, they probably don't need nearly as much water as your turf. So most people, don't choose that option because it is more time. But again, it's really just what your goals are and what your priorities are. If you want to be as efficient from a time standpoint, that makes sense. But if you want to save as much water as possible, then I recommend not converting that and having a drip run off of your turf zone and just hand water the plants. You can also have a drip, I think, run off your spigot potentially. Like you can. And I actually have that at my house. That's how we water our garden is off of a spigot because we don't have an end ground system. Right. So that works as well. And Nico, it looks like there's a question to share that QR code again. I'm assuming okay. you water, wide, water wise yard seminars. <laughs> yes. Let me actually stop my screen sharing and I can pull that back up and share again. I think this is what we're going for. Yeah, the second page there. Mm -hmm. There we go. Are you seeing that, Lisa? Yeah. Okay. Great. All right, I'll leave that up for a few more minutes. And then for anyone who is still around, again, thank you for joining us. If you are interested in our Slow the Flow program, which Lisa and I both work on, uh, again, we provide free sprinkler evaluations. We are wrapping up our season and we don't really have any more availability in most areas at, at, for this year. But most of our water provider partners do renew their contracts with us year after year. So if you are interested in a free sprinkler evaluation from us next year, we do recommend that you go ahead and sign up because that will put you at the top of the list or higher up on the list for next year because we do offer that service on a first come first serve basis. And our specific website is resourcecentral.org slash sprinklers. And there's more information. There's even a little video about our service on there. All right, Lisa, do you have anything else to add? 
No, there was a lot more stuff I wanted to go over, but I, <laughs> I know three hours worth of content that I, I was know. To an yeah. hour. So, but at least now, folks, <laughs> you know, it, at least have an, a rudimentary, you know, can speak sprinkler, you know, right? There's a lot to know. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and close out the webinar. So, again, everybody, thank you for participating. We appreciate it. And we hope to see you in this, in our Solar Flow program or in our other programs. So, thanks a bunch. Thank you.